Hello, and welcome to the Hub again. I'm Wang Guanyin Beijing. With the U.S. midterm elections on November the eighth coming closer, who is going to win? The Republicans are racing to regain the House of Representatives and dominate the Senate, but will they succeed? Look at headlines since the last polls in 2020: more mass shootings, Roe versus Wade overturned by the Supreme Court. Uh, investigation into the Capitol riots, and even a raid on former U.S. President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago residency. What will be the impact of high inflation and low support for President Joe Biden? And will we see more China bullying customary before U.S. elections? Today we have a very distinguished panel. Bill Schneider is a professor of policy, government, and international affairs at George Mason University in Virginia. Rick Dunham is former White House correspondent for Business Week. He's based in Washington D.C. In Detroit, Michigan, we have Haz Al Din, political analyst and host of the Infrared Show, and Einar Tengen, political and economic affairs commentator in Beijing. Welcome to the Hub, gentlemen. Great to have you all. Professor Bill Schneider, let me start with you.、Um, President Joe Biden seemed to have been hectic as the nine-week countdown to midterm elections has started. In his speech in Wisconsin, he outlined the achievements of his presidency, of course, and even added a new word to the dictionary: Trumpy.、Um, what does that mean, and how do you look at his chances for midterm elections?、Uh, I mean, his and、uh, the chances of his Democratic Party. He went to Wisconsin. He went to Pennsylvania. Those are two very important states, and the reason they're very important. Is that they both voted for Trump in 2016, and then they switched and voted for Biden, the Democrat, in 2020. So those two states are up for grabs. That's why Biden has spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania and in Wisconsin, because those are two battleground states that are very much at the center of this year's election. Those states, like you said, were battleground states.、Uh, sometimes they're red, sometimes they're blue.、Uh, what's your best prediction for you know their voting pattern this year? I can't make a prediction because we don't know、uh, exactly where they stand. I mean, the polls show a very close race in both cases.、Uh, you, you can't really make a confident prediction. Mostly, it depends on where the economy is going. Biden is trying to run against Trump. This is an unusual midterm election because at the center of this election are two figures who are both very unpopular: President Biden, who is held responsible for the inflation that's dismaying a lot of Americans, and Donald Trump, who's re-entered the political scene. All the news for the last few weeks has been about Trump, 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 and Trump is not a popular figure. Both Biden and Trump are unpopular figures in the United States, and it's, a, it's still a question which of them is going to be the real center of the campaign. In 2022. So, Rick, a new Gallup poll shows President Joe Biden's approval rating has improved, actually, from a record low in July to 44 percent now, up by six points. What do you think is behind this rise? Well, I think there are three major factors behind it. One is the emergence of Donald Trump.、Uh, Donald Trump, both for the、uh, hearings about the、uh, riot at the Capitol on January 6, 2021. Uh, the second is the raid,、uh, the FBI raid of his Mar-a-Lago、uh, country club and and home,、uh, and then just Donald Trump being out there, being as Joe Biden has said, Trumpy,、uh, and I think that it's made people think、uh, and think a little more fondly about Joe Biden and his boring non-Twitter presidency. So I think that's that's one thing. The second is that inflation. Has subsided a bit. It's still high in the United States, lower than in most countries around the world. But gasoline prices have consistently、uh, gone down for weeks now, and uh, and, and uh, people are not as、uh, worried about inflation.、Uh, it, the Republicans don't seem to be getting as much traction when they talk about inflation because voters are thinking about Donald Trump and threats to democracy and abortion and other issues. The third thing is that Joe Biden's had some successes. Um, Congress passed major legislation uh, that uh, that that included new health care provisions, and, and in addition to to that,、uh, climate change provisions.、Uh, Joe Biden offered、uh, relief on student debt, and so the, those three things have really helped helped him get to a place where most presidents are at this point in the presidency, instead of at a very low level. Einer, let's talk about the youth vote.、Uh, another opinion show by New York Times suggested that、uh, Biden was not、uh, and still is not very popular among the youth. And this year, 
there will be 8 million new voters in the midterm elections, basically their teens. How do you see the youth voting this year? In 2016, they uh, had uh, about 49% uh, uh, voted. In 2020, you had 57% uh, uh, going. That's an 8% jump. That's huge. And that's in that 16 to 30, uh, 18 to 35 range. All right, Haas, a, a special welcome to you, as this is the first time you're joining us on the Hub on CGTN. What is your overall ob observation of U.S. politics as of now, especially as he is heading up to the midterm elections? It seems to me that America is increasingly um, defined by a single contradiction. It seems like the polarization of the country has only accelerated under the presidency of Biden rather than uh, unified, as he had hoped. And it seems that this polarization seems to be along the lines of whether or not our country is going to be um, based on its reality as a substantive community or whether it's going to be based on, in Biden's words, an idea, universal human rights, um, you know, international interventions, and so on. And then where, where do you see this battle headed? Idealism versus um, realism, if you will? I think the contradiction uh, is too acute and too substantive to be resolved through matters of policy. The contradiction has outpaced, in my view, what the political institutions in the United States are capable of resolving. So I have a very pessimistic view as far as the future of the United States is concerned. It seems increasingly clear that political loyalties are no longer to the state, at least in its official um, and formal reality, but to other forms of political uh, community. Right. Professor Schneider, abortion rights is expected to be a key factor since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June, saying there's no longer a federal constitutional right to abortion. Uh, protests are, have been growing. How do you see women voters responding this time around? They're responding with anger and they're responding by registering to vote in unprecedented numbers, particularly young women who see this as an attack on their personal rights. Abortion is a key issue. The rule in American politics is you can't take away people's rights without expecting a ferocious political backlash. I mean, interesting enough, the number of women registering to vote has jumped in key midterm states such as Louisiana, uh, Idaho and Wisconsin. Um, some of these are red states or traditionally wet states where abortion is now you know, made illegal uh, altogether. Will the midterms be a gender battle? Well, men are not anti-abortion. Um, most younger men, in fact, are pro-choice, just like most younger women. But for younger women, this is personal. It's not as personal for younger men. So I'm not sure men are going to rush to register and vote in large numbers the way women are. But you're not seeing a gender battle over the abortion issue because men and women uh, are not very different on the abortion issue. The, the difference is really explained mostly by religion and religious values, not by gender or male-female. All right, Einer, despite the gun control law President Joe Biden signed in June, uh, gun violence continued in the United States. Uh, how significant will be gun violence and gun control uh, when it comes to uh, voter preference this year? Well, it's number three on the list. Number one is inflation. Uh, one poll I was reading said put it at about 61 percent, which is uh, just slightly down from uh, four months ago. Uh, in May, but uh, the second one is is um, you know this this issue of about abortion and rights, and the last one extremism uh, is uh, at tw was at twenty nine percent in May, and it's at thirty one percent in August. Mm -hmm. So gun violence, uh, abortion, inflation, these are all issues. But you know the important thing to remember here is that if you go down the top ten issues, they're all domestic. So in in answer to the question that you asked my colleague between realism and idealism, I can tell you as uh, having been in politics in Wisconsin, it's all about realism. Uh, people vote their pocketbook before they get involved. Uh, there's, there's not even a blip on the radar in terms of this kind of international uh, stuff that uh, Biden's been pushing. Yeah, we've seen rejection or resentment towards uh, US interventions in many parts of the states um, over and over again in the past decades. Rick, how is it going for Trump supporters in the primaries? Uh, the biggest boost when was when Liz Cheney, his uh, Republican critic, lost her bid 
from Wyoming to the candidate he endorsed, um, Harriet Hegeman. How would you rate the Trump influence? Well, the Trump influence is tremendous in the Republican Party. It's Donald Trump's party now. It's not the party that I covered uh, from when I started covering politics in 1980 all the all the way to the Obama White House. Uh, but if you if you look at the at the uh, primaries, uh, he has won 100 percent every single one of the Senate races where he's endorsed candidates. He's won 75 percent of the House races where he's endorsed candidates, including defeating Liz Cheney, including. Uh, ousting several of the House Republicans uh, who voted to impeach him. Uh, and in terms of statewide offices, whether it is governorships or the, the Secretary of State's jobs, uh, he has won more than 70% of those where he has endorsed. Now, he's had some high profile defeats, uh, but, uh, but you can just say he has put his imprint on the Republican Party. Whether this is good for the Republicans in the general election is still to be determined. Uh, several of the Senate candidates he endorsed are extreme. Several of the sen those se same Senate candidates are first time candidates and they've made mistake after mistake and they're trailing in key, uh, in, in key uh, polls. And so what may happen is that Donald Trump wins control of the Republican party, but the Republicans may not gain control of the Senate like they had expected just a few months ago. Right. You know, Rahaz, people thought Trump would make it uh, clear whether or not he would join the 2024 presidential election. Uh, he said he would, or he, you know, suggestions are that he would, but he has not announced his intentions. Uh, why is that? And also, um, will 2024, in your opinion, still be a contest between Biden and Trump? I think Trump's hesitancy to announce his election in 2024 probably relates to the legal troubles he's now facing. As many of us know, he's um, he's in, embattled in a number of lawsuits uh, ranging over his personal businesses toward the circumstances that we now find uh, with the recent FBI raid. So I'm sure that there's um, a hidden legal context for his he uh, hesitation for announcing his campaign. Uh, additionally, if Donald Trump runs in 2024 and uh, faces Biden, I think this is going to probably uh, accelerate to an unprecedented degree the polarization that we're now seeing uh, to the point where, you know, there's many dangers as far as the American political system are concerned. Both sides, whether it's in 2016 with the uh, Russiagate affair or in 2020, seem to be um, unwilling to accept the outcomes of the elections as far as the formal procedure is concerned. Could there be new faces coming up from both the parties? I mean, mostly the Republican Party? Yes, Ron DeSantis, who's the, currently the governor of Florida, um, there's a lot of speculation that DeSantis may try to run. Now, personally speaking, I don't think any of the other Republicans have a chance. I think the Republican electorate is completely dissatisfied and disillusioned with the establishment Republicans. DeSantis, however, because of his uh, unique COVID policies, as well as his cultural policies, specifically fighting against uh, the woke, quote unquote, agenda in Florida, seems to have adopted the kind of veneer of being a populist uh, alternative to Trump in the eyes of Republican voters. So I think uh, DeSantis challenging Trump is a very high possibility. Professor Schneider, you've been in politics, uh, commentary, uh, scholarship for, for decades. I want to ask you about this. Uh, do you see chances of new faces emerging from both Democratic and Republican parties for 2024? Um, if so, who? 2024 is unlikely. Uh, one thing that is, that is a key factor here is Biden's age. He will be 82 years old in 2024. 82 years old. That is a very advanced age. He would be the oldest presidential candidate we've ever had. Uh, we don't know. I mean, we hope his health holds up all right. But there'll be there is a lot of skepticism in the Republican Party, that they, I mean, Democratic Party, the Democratic Party, that they can win with an 82 year old leader. Look, you've got two figures at the center of this campaign, both of whom are pretty unpopular. Donald Trump is seen as extreme, as undemocratic. That's what Biden is running on. 
Uh, do you really want to elect an extremist as president who doesn't have respect for democratic norms? But Biden's big problem is he has long been seen as weak. He is a weak president. That may be changing a little bit because he's won some victories on climate change, student loans, veterans benefits, prescription drugs, but he's always been seen as a weak president. Americans do not like a weak president, but they don't like an extremist president either. That's a very difficult choice and an unpleasant choice for most Americans to make. And that's why this election is such a right. strange election. It's a choice between two negatives. Right. But Bill, it's unusual for a party um, to change leaders. Um, I mean, for uh, an upcoming election, right? There are one term presidents like um, Carter, uh, Ford, uh, Bush, 41, you name it. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's unusual for a party to change leader leaders or a, a political candidate halfway through. That's right. It's, it's, I, think, I can't think of a case where it's actually happened, where a sitting president has been overturned in the primaries. It came very close in 1980 with Jimmy Carter when he was opposed by Ted right. Kennedy, uh, but that, and that was a very close race, uh, but Carter eventually won. Um, the president of the United States has a lot of power, particularly in his own party, and partisans value party loyalty. They are loyal to their president. And now with Biden picking up a little bit of support because he has one on some partisan issues, and he's shown that he's in, he has an ability to win, which is very, very important to Democrats. Progressives were losing faith in him because they saw him as a weak president who kept losing and losing and losing. Now that he's winning a bit, I think he'll have the support of his party for renomination. So even at 82 years old, a very advanced age, uh, he may still run in 2024. 82 years old is a very advanced age. And there's, what, what I would call it is a whispering campaign. It's not outright. No one, very few Democrats so far have stood up and said, he's too old. We can't nominate an 82-year-old man to be president. But it is a whispering campaign behind the scenes. It could come out as a real issue anytime soon. Uh, you saw a similar thing happening in 1984 when there was a bit of a whispering campaign over whether Ronald Reagan was becoming senile. Uh, he was, actually. We saw a lot of experts saw the beginnings of Alzheimer's disease, which eventually killed him. Uh, after he left the office, but you, you, we're there, what, what's happening is a whispering campaign about Joe Biden. Can we really nominate an 82-year-old man and expect to win? That's a problem for him. Yeah, guys, I want to shift gears and talk about foreign policy. Einer, let me start with you. We've seen the hectic, chaotic scenes of U.S. troops pulling out of Afghanistan. Uh, there's a war in Ukraine, an intensified confrontation between Washington and Beijing. Um, how do you expect foreign policies to affect the midterm elections coming forward? Well, that's the irony. I mean, uh, Biden's uh, trying to use foreign policy as, as somewhat as a deflection from his uh, domestic failures. Uh, yes, he's gained some traction. He's at 44% from a historic low. I don't think that's necessarily uh, going to push him through. Um, you know, quite frankly, my estimation is he doesn't run. Um, I think he's lost the fire. He definitely wants to keep Donald Trump out. Remember, if Donald Trump's uh, slate gets beaten, uh, this this uh, particular uh, failure will be tied around his neck, and it will definitely impact whether or not he can run. But in terms of why he isn't running, and you know, you know, Trump would definitely be pushing the international buttons, hot issues. You know, Biden's weak, Biden's weak, Biden's weak. Uh, is that he has a hundred million reasons not to. He's been collecting money, but he cannot shift that money to his uh, his presidential campaign or to a PAC that supports it. So he has. He has this um, dilemma. Donald Trump doesn't like giving money away. And uh, right now he has a, sitting on a huge cash trough, over 100 million, and he's trying to figure out what to do with it and how to time this. It is actually be better for him uh, to declare his candidacy at this point, because then he can go back to I'm a victim of a witch hunt uh, narrative that he's been pushing uh, for many of the <laughs> forever, I think. Yeah, Rick, let's talk about Ukraine. In November, the Ukraine war will be in its eighth month, according to Gallup poll, while 46% approve of President Joe Biden's handling of the Ukraine situation. 39% think uh, he is tackling relations with Russia well, actually. Uh, this seems to be different from the usual anti-Russia sentiment. What do you think is the reason? Well, first, all polling on foreign policy 
uh, needs to be taken with a grain of salt because half of the electorate that voted for Donald Trump will say that they disapprove of anything that has to do with Biden and, and policy. And so I, I think what's interesting there is that Biden has near universal support among the non-Trump supporters for, uh, for his policy on Ukraine. Uh, and, but, but he doesn't have quite that level on dealing with Russia. And I think it's for one basic reason, Vladimir Putin is still in power. Uh, I mean, yes, the United States has played a role in uniting Europe and, and much of the world uh, to uh, help the resistance to the Russian aggression, but, uh, but Joe Biden has not really fundamentally changed uh, Russian policy uh, or the trajectory of Russia exerting its uh, military influence around the world. Has, how do you look at the foreign policy factor for the midterm elections? I somewhat agree um, that the foreign policy agenda is not very high on the list of priorities for American voters. However, it does seem very clear that uh, for the American electorate, especially from the Trump side, you know, Biden's seven, nearly $70 billion sent to Ukraine is seen as an outrage. Um, they're not very big fans of just sending out um, their tax dollars to, you know, foreign agendas that they don't seem to be able to fully understand. And I think the Ukraine issue has come to be, it has acquired the status of a kind of scandal within American politics, especially considering um, Hunter Biden's connections to Ukraine and how all of those were exposed. I, I think overall Americans are dissatisfied with Joe Biden's current foreign policy orientation, despite the fact that he has attempted to use it as a form of posturing about, you know, his uh, strength. Mm. Professor Schneider, uh, talking about Joe Biden's China policy, we saw a continuation of, uh, you know, of China policy from the Trump era, uh, very tough uh, China policies, uh, which were interpreted as a new Cold War by many analysts. Uh, do you think the tough stance on China uh, would benefit Joe Biden at all? for the midterm elections and also for 2024? Well, China is not seen as a security threat right now to the United States. It's seen as an economic threat, as a country that's out competing the United States. And that's, that's been a longstanding perception. The real enemy in terms of American security is Russia, Iran, even North Korea, but not, not necessarily China. You know, the defining moment for Biden's politics as well as his foreign policy was the withdrawal from Afghanistan. When that happened in August, 2020, in August 2021, it was a moment of humiliation for the United States. And it confirmed the image that Biden is a weak president. It was humiliating, it was disastrous. It meant that the whole 21 year involvement in Afghanistan had been a waste. That we overthrew the Taliban in 2001, and now the Taliban is back in power. That was something Amer that really angers a lot of Americans. And it's the most important moment for most people mm -hmm. in their image of Biden's foreign policy. I mean, optics matters, uh, obviously, uh, in a way. Um, it could all be about optics uh, among certain demographics. Uh, Einer, what do you think about uh, Joe Biden's China policy and whether it will help or hurt uh, his chances and the chances of his party for midterm elections? Well, if you go down the top 10 issues, uh, neither Ukraine nor uh, Taiwan are on them. Uh, as I said, uh, elections in the U.S. are about domestic issues, especially with inflation rearing its ugly head, uh, divisiveness, political violence, gun uh, issues, and also abortion. This is really the last thing on people's mind. And, you know, that I, I agree with um, my colleague who said that most Americans don't understand why they're sending more money overseas after they've already had a humiliating defeat um, in Afghanistan. Uh, Iraq is no shining example either. So um, American uh, adventurism, uh, the appetite in terms of the common man is not very high on the list. And that's why I'm saying that uh, it's unclear to me why Biden stuck with the Trump uh, foreign policy, especially towards China. There was an opportunity there to immediately you know, sweep clean, get rid of the tariffs that are adding to the current inflation and to try to make a break. Uh, he, he could have gone in a number of different directions. It didn't have to be completely conciliatory, but he could said, look, we're, you know, we're gonna put economics first and we're gonna put Americans first. 
and see how that worked. He didn't do it. He's been very timid. He's afraid of the Republican shadow. Uh, it's uh, bewildering to me. The Republicans are never going to like him. So I don't know why he's afraid of their criticism. Has on social media, that, you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's one issue that no one has mentioned. It's a big issue to a lot of Americans. Immigration. We've had a million immigrants. I'm not sure they're mostly illegal, but we've had a million immigrants to the United States because there are a lot of jobs here. And if you want to curb the immigration to the United States, a recession would certainly do it. If the jobs aren't there, then they're not going to be people coming to the United States. Immigration in a lot of the country, particularly in Texas, California, Arizona, and other states along the border, immigration is a very powerful issue. And it, it creates a lot of resentment among Americans. It's mostly a domestic issue, but it's a, to some extent also a foreign policy issue. Americans feel invaded. And of course, a lot of that, that is behind the Trump movement because they feel that there's a deliberate effort to change the political consensus in the United States by inviting in a lot of foreigners. Yeah, how to secure the, the you know the southern border has been a hotly debated issue, right? Um, uh, finally, we'll have time for one last question. Has on social media, you have been vocal about uh, you know Washington being tough on China. Uh, you tweeted that uh, the ruling class is trying to go to war with China to save themselves from a war with the working class. End quote. Uh, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that we are facing a systemic and I alluded to this earlier, political, but in addition, economic crisis, not only in the United States, but in the entire Western world as we know it. The U.S. created Bretton Woods system, which was created after the post-war period, which was meant to establish this international economic system, is breaking down. And plainly put, if the not only the government and the policymakers, but if the ruling class within the United States that has benefited from this system have to face the, you know, the people of the United States and of Europe, uh, it wouldn't bode well for them as far as their political um, reign is concerned. The American working class is increasingly fed up with these, you know, not only these extravagant foreign policy interventions, but in additionally to a system that no longer seems to work. I mean, we're seeing the effects of inflation right now but it's only a symptom of a, of a broader disease. In 2008, with the financial crash that left you know, millions of Americans uh, bankrupt and jobless, we are starting to see that with an ascendant uh, Chinese and multipolar economic system, a mul one that's based on multilateral respect for mutual sovereignty, um, it seems like there are a lot of questions the people of the United States and of Europe would have for the current uh, ruling class, such as the fact, why aren't we investing more money in infrastructure? Why aren't we cooperating with countries like China and Russia to build mutual prosperity um, for our respective countries and peoples? Why don't we join things like the Belt and Road Initiative? I think the American ruling class is trying to deflect away from these kinds of initiatives because admittedly, mm -hmm. it would pose a threat to the monopolies with which they have risen to power on the basis of. It would give ordinary Americans a chance at economic prosperity and success with new economic cooperation and the development of the productive forces comes new opportunities for prosperity and wealth. And it just seems like the monopolist ruling class in the United States wants to foreclose the ability for the ordinary American worker to experience a chance at that wealth. Very interesting insight. Very interesting insight. So we'll have to leave it there, but do come back to our program, Haz. And thank you, gentlemen, for your perspectives. That will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. I'll see you again next time. <laughs>